paper is present, and something for others is called the soul. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And our uh, expert from London, uh, the U.S. Yeah. Well, then I think we all are going to get wired for sound here for our own. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is yeah. 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 our own team. So that if anyone doesn't get anything or needs it, we can give you a transcript. Thank you very much for having us in this very famous Oval Office. <laughs> when our group discussed the framework of this interview, it was very hard to achieve a consensus regarding the priority of questions. We hope there will be no such problem at the summit meeting in Bonn, which is of course the main purpose of your visit in Europe. The world is faced with a problem how the economic momentum can be sustained and secured after the U.S. locomotive seems to be slowing. How do you see uh, the economic scenario in America and globally, and what would be, in your view, the best outcome in, uh, in Bonn? What should be done at the summit meeting? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to attempt to set an agenda for it. I know that we'll be talking about political problems, we'll be talking about economic, this economic situation. And uh, I know that our economy, uh, our economic recovery did get out ahead uh, of the others. I think one of the things that's of great importance that we want to be talking about, and that is another round of trade talks to resist the protectionism that uh, raises its head every once in a while and to see if we can't come more and more to open trade uh, uh, between ourselves and other industrial countries. That will be, I'm quite sure, prominent on the, uh, on the agenda. I know that in the last two uh, summits, uh, we've also exchanged ideas about uh, what we all can do and to help in the recovery, and I'm glad to see recovery uh, beginning to take hold in those other countries uh, that will hopefully equalize the currency values and so forth. And, and uh, I know that just as one country, our own, can export inflation and uh, economic problems, it can also export uh, prosperity and help to the recovery. And I think uh, we are having a hand in that especially for Western Europe, you rec recommended recently at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, I remember, to follow your recovery program of 81 by cutting taxes, spending and over-regulation and throwing off debt weight of government. What kind of tax cuts did you mean? Lesser income taxes or only incentives for investments and innovations? Well, High tax rates do not necessarily mean high revenues for government. As a matter of fact, this, we think, was responsible for our recent recession, is that our government was taking too big a share of the private sector. And I think that other countries, some of our allies and friends, uh, are looking at themselves uh, to see if this is the same situation. When we reduced the rates, there was an increase, a surge in the overall revenues because of the economic expansion that resulted. Incentive, whether it's for business and industry or for individuals, does result in higher earnings. Uh, there is a, there is a, or was a, an Arab philosopher uh, about 1400 years ago by the name of Ibn Khaldun, who said in the beginning of the empire, the rates were high or the rates were low and the revenues were great. And he said, at the end of the empire, the rates were great and the revenues were low. 
Um, Mr. President, uh, I wanted to ask you something about uh, uh, the dollar and the international monetary system. Uh, the dollar has lost in the past month about 20% of its value, and before then, in a matter of a few weeks, went very, very high, reaching uh, high records against the Deutschmark and other currency. Uh, the monetary system is uh, unstable and volatile. Uh, your Secretary of the Treasury uh, said that he was willing to do something about it, and it seems that something should be done. How strong is your commitment for a high-level monetary meeting uh, that should be hosted in Washington? And uh, what concrete steps are you willing to take to improve this shaky system? Well, I'm afraid your question is too specific for the answers that I have available at this time. Two years ago at the Williamsburg Conference, or summit, we uh, all agreed upon embarking on a study the, uh, the European 10, ourselves and others, are trading partners. And that study's been going on for two years. Uh, the study will be and the report will come in in June after uh, the summit conference in Bonn. And I think when we get that report and see the recommendations and what has been proposed, then it can be determined whether a meeting of the kind that has been suggested uh, is warranted and what the agenda would be uh, as that meeting would then take up the report of this two-year study. So until then, I can't comment on an agenda. So are you backing off from the statement of Mr. Baker that said oh, that no. Washington would No, I think this is what he was also trying to say is that we're perfectly willing, but we feel that we should wait and see what is, what's the result of that that study, what, uh, what are we going to uh, be hearing and, and seeing as a result of that? And uh, of course, to your first part of your, the preface to your question there about the dollar declining, uh, we think that that in part could be attributed to the economic recovery of our trading partners. Uh, we think also that some of the fluctuation has to do with uh, speculators those people who read all the economic signs and then go running out and either buy or sell uh, other currencies or our own, and that this can, on a simple buy and sell market, uh, result in changes. Frankly, we were, we were very pleased with the, the decline in value. Uh, uh, let me ask a question with regard to trade, Mr. President. How are, how are you going to deal with the trade conflicts? between Japan and the United States. And do you think that uh, you have to blame Mr. Nagasone for his inability, even at the meeting of one summit? Well, we think we've been making great progress uh, in the bilateral meetings that we've been having. I can tell you that Prime Minister Nagasone, I think uh, uh, himself is committed to a belief in more open and free trade uh, between nations. Uh, I realize that just as all heads of state do, he has some political <coughs> problems too uh, in opposition to some things that some moves he might want to make. Uh, the same would be true of me here in our own country. But we have made great progress and I think we're, we'll continue to make progress in opening up markets uh, to open trade uh, between allies. And I'm uh, I have a great admiration for uh, what he is doing and what he has set out to do. Mr. President, in recent years, your trade policy officials have, have made much, much of their efforts to promote the multilateral trade system. At the same time, they've used the possibility of bilateral deals with individual countries um, as, as something of a lever to bring other trading partners to the bargaining table. I'm, there, there are experts who suggest that um, subjecting a fifth or a quarter of your trade, of, your, of the United States external trade, to a deal perhaps with Canada could um, weaken the multilateral trading system. I'm wondering, A, how you feel about that, but secondly, what happens if there is a new GATT round? What happens to the bilateral deals at that point? Well, because the direction that the bilateral is taking between us and Canada. We've been 
uh, for each other. We've been the greatest trading, trading partners. Here we are with a very unique border that extends for several thousand miles uh, with uh, no guards or, or forts along that border. Uh, we have a pretty common heritage in this country. It's been reflected in, in trade and sometimes there have been uh, uh, efforts uh, here and there in particular areas uh, to curb trade. But uh, no, we, uh, just as we're uh, meeting with uh, Prime Minister Nakasone, we, we have been meeting with Canada to eliminate some of the problems that in reality <laughs> are peculiar to our two countries. And um, I don't think that that in any way does anything but even uh, strengthen or add to the, our multilateral efforts. It's, it just demonstrates that uh, countries can uh, mutually benefit from free and open trade. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. President, I, I imagine that there'll be a number of leaders in Bonn who would like to uh, discuss with you your strategic defense initiative. Um, during your visit there. Um, the question I wanted to ask was that uh, the British Foreign Secretary recently raised some concerns about, about your initiative. He warned that there would be no advantage in creating a new Maginot line which could be outflanked by simpler countermeasures. And he also suggested that the huge research program might acquire an unstoppable momentum of its own. I wonder what your reaction would be to those two, two, two points. Well, I think, that's, I think that's in a sense borrowing uh, trouble. We are embarked on a research program. We don't have something ready for deployment. We're not talking about, uh, about deploying. What we're researching to see is if there is an answer to the nuclear threat to all the world. We, we have a situation now between the major powers uh, where uh, we have a deterrent based totally on offensive weapons. And uh, in our own country, it's called the, the MAD policy. And what it stands for is mutual assured uh, destruction. Uh, meaning that, and there, to me, there's always been something a little immoral about that, that uh, our deterrent is if you try to blow our people up, we'll blow yours up. Now, if there is a, in the whole history of the world, every offensive weapon has always led to a defensive weapon. We're doing a research. If we could come up with a defense that would, in effect, make nuclear weapons obsolete, I think it would aid in what we're doing in Geneva with our arms reduction talks. An effort to reduce greatly the number of such weapons in the world to the point that we don't leave as a heritage to our children this threat of destruction, literally, of the world if some madman comes along someday in one country or the other and uh, decides uh, to take that action. And uh, I've made it perfectly plain that if, I have a, if our research, while I have any claim to it, is, is uh, successful in any way, before there would ever be deployment, I would want to sit down with our allies and uh, discuss this totally as to, and share. And uh, I haven't even ruled out sharing with uh, our potential adversaries if we could substitute for simply an exchange of offensive threats, either totally defense or a combination of, of the two so that uh, we weren't just living under this total threat that threatens uh, even the rest of the world who might not even be participants except in the destruction. Uh, still on this subject, Mr. President, uh, President Mitterrand of France have invited other European countries to join efforts to create uh, a European technological co cooperation. I was wondering what you think of this initiative and if you don't think that uh, SDI has set the stage for a technological confrontation between Europe and the United States. 
I don't know that I can answer that. I imagine that I'll be hearing about the, <laughs> that at the summit, and I'll be looking forward to the discussion of it. Uh, uh, the only restriction we've ever wanted to place on technology is the letting or giving that technology uh, to a potential adversary who uh, then could, could use it to, um, uh, uh, to an advantage uh, over us uh, militarily. And uh, that has, that's been the result of COCOM, which we have uh, with our allies uh, in our restraint on providing such technology uh, to the other country. I know that we, uh, on SDI, uh, we have uh, invited uh, all of our allies to come in and compete for contracts on, on the research and to participate in the research on, on that weapon. I think I, on, your, on that previous question, I left out something or other uh, there that I should have said in addition, and that is that on SDI, also, that in the meantime, no, we feel that we support France and England in going forward on uh, their own uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's been made necessary. Uh, we are, as you know, going forward with ours, with the MX, with the B-1 bomber, and even a bomber beyond that, and with the Trident submarine, uh, because that, to use one of our own expressions, that's the only game in town. Now, did I finish with yours? Uh, well, uh, you, no, I think, <laughs> we could go on just to make but a question. The president and NATO is uh, today much stronger than it were in <coughs> 81 when you assumed the presidency, thanks to the United States. Well, thank but you. Is the Na Na NATO in these days strong enough? Is it strong enough? I think basically the, uh, uh, for a deterrent, yes. There is no question we do not match the Soviet Union in its military buildup, either in the strategic or in the conventional. But I think in the sense of a deterrent, that a, a war uh, trying to take advantage of, of their um, superior forces, uh, they would face more damage than uh, they would want to accept. So I, I think that from a deterrent standpoint, yes. Who stopped uh, the stationing of the Pershing II in Germany? Is that only for technical reasons? Or has it uh, something to do with the Ge yes, Geneva we have, uh, uh, yeah, we have not, control not, talks? We've not stopped that uh, on a basis of changing a policy. No, we're going forward with that plan. Uh, those countries requested those weapons of us, and the Soviets have continued to augment their intermediate range weapons uh, that are targeted on European uh, targets. Uh, no, we're, uh, we would like in the talks going on at Geneva, we would like something that would indicate that uh, they were willing to reduce those. You know, our original proposal on the intermediate range weapons was uh, total elimination, zero, zero. Well, we gained half our point. Soviets agreed to zero for us, but uh, not zero for them. But uh, we're, we're going to continue. Incidentally, I want you to know also that SDI and the research that's going forward is not just aimed at strategic weapons, such as a protection for ourselves. It is, would be very definitely uh, a factor with regard to those SS-20s, those uh, Soviet intermediate range weapons for protection of the Allies. Yes, Mr. President, uh, we are going to have very soon in Italy local elections. And the Communist Party has said that if it should win those local elections, it would give them a political national meaning. And they would want to be in charge of the government, to put the crisis on the Craxi government and head a new government headed by communists. How would you feel about that? We were talking about NATO and all of this. How would you feel about the communists taking the leadership in Italy? Well, if you look at any country in the world that is run by a communist government, you see that the people are denied all the democratic rights 
that we and our societies have come to believe our uh, democracy and are the rights of the people. I can't quite believe that the Italian people, with their love of independence and freedom, uh, would settle for what the communist government uh, would mean to them and would take away from them. Uh, so I hope it doesn't happen, but uh, if it does, uh, from what I know of your people, I would think the communists might get a rude surprise when they started to implement uh, their ideology. And uh, just one second about Europe, uh, Mr. President. It seems that Europe uh, is uh, the balance. You have asked Europe to take responsibility on the economic side, and uh, uh, it's also a quite balanced point of equilibrium from the political side. Uh, how strong do you feel that Europe should be united politically? And how do you feel about uh, a unified European monetary system to balance the general equilibrium? Oh, I don't know the way. I want to get into things that are purely... Uh, uh, just your opinion. Yes, <laughs> between those, those uh, <coughs> countries. But it seems to me that, uh, as you so graciously said about uh, the alliance and its closeness now, it seems to me that there is a greater bond, uh, certainly in Western Europe, which is all we can talk about, a uh, bond between the countries than I can remember in my rather long lifetime, a friendship, and now with the Congress that I will be addressing there that represents all the countries of Europe, elected by, directly by all the people of Europe and the European community, uh, all of these things I think uh, are uh, great, uh, represent great progress. In the monetary system? Now, you're, you're suggesting a single monetary... U European monetary system. European. I don't... <laughs> I just don't feel that I could comment on that. I, I've, I haven't done any study on my own of uh, what that could mean or what the problems might be. Uh, uh, I just hesitate to comment. Okay. Well, let me follow up my question uh, uh, on trade. Uh, do you think that Bonn Summit would be able to set early 1986 as a target for starting a new round of uh, multilateral trade talks? Well, that's what we're going to ask for, is that the trade round begin early in 1986. And I have a feeling that uh, we're not going to be alone in that. Uh, I think there are others that, that want to see uh, another trade round. So uh, I'm hopeful that'll be an outcome of this summit. Are you relatively optimistic about this result, outcome of the talk? Well, so far, uh, everything has shown progress. There haven't been very many setbacks uh, in the sense of, of countries adopting more protectionist measures. My own feeling is that protectionism uh, just leads to a restraint in trade and a lowering of prosperity for everyone involved. And the, uh, I know in our own Great Depression back in the early 30s, I believe that depression was worsened and was maintained over a longer period of time than need be because our country turned to a thing called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. And I think that was a, a great factor in our decline. So um, I just know, I think that, I think all the signs, maybe the progress hasn't been as fast as we'd all like, but it has been progress. Just on that, on that same point, Mr. President, if there is no agreement for a 1986 start to the GATT round, is it your feeling that uh, an, another Smoot-Hawley can, can surface uh, quickly and, and, and it will be beyond your control? Is that what you're saying to the world? No, really, because I know that there are, there are factions in our own country, as there are in every country, who um, uh, want protectionism. But I think the progress we've made so far and the recovery, economic recovery we're having, I believe we can defeat uh, those protectionist factions. Now, what could happen if uh, others suddenly ab adopted protectionism and strengthened the hand thereby of 
those people in our own country, uh, I don't know, but I don't see any, I don't see any threat of that right now. The less developed, developed countries, of course, aren't at the table in Bonn. Uh, they have a special interest in, in what takes place. Uh, of course, their, their debt problems uh, we all know about. Um, will you be pushing the, uh, your, your fellow summiteers to, to perhaps drop their own protectionist policies with regard to the third world? Textiles comes to mind, sugar quotas. Yeah. I think it could help um, help those countries. We've all expressed a desire to help the lesser developed countries, and too much of the time that has taken the uh, the form of just uh, economic aid, handouts. I think that we should be directing ourselves more to helping them help themselves, and in that connection, I have to say our own country, this country has purchased more of the production, and particularly manufactured goods, of the lesser developed countries than all the rest of the world put together. And uh, I don't think it's hurt us. Our recovery continues. But your Caribbean initiative, for example, explicitly excludes textiles. Why not include it? We have, we have had a, a setup on textiles with regard to growth because and this I think every country agrees on, that here and there when an industry is faced with a crisis, uh, a temporary situation to uh, help rather than let them go down to destruction, yes, we've all done that and we have done it. Uh, we've, we have a, a, a steel program in our country that is only invoked uh, in the event of unfair competition uh, first, but also if it is leading to uh, the, a, a disaster, and then we have temporarily invoked uh, some regulations to, to help them get on their feet again. Uh, Mr. President, um, <clears throat> when Mr. Gorbachev took over as Soviet leader, Mr. Schultz greeted the event as a moment of opportunity for an across-the-board improvement in relations. Uh, do you think that the killing of the U.S. major in East Germany and Mr. Gorbachev's latest accusations about the Geneva negotiations mean that we're now in for another rough period of East-West relations? Well, I think it was in keeping with what has been the Soviet attitude and other things of that kind, including the shooting down of the Korean airliner. Uh, we certainly, out in the Western world, I don't think can uh, quite understand that kind of attitude. I think they missed a great opportunity to achieve some stature in the world by not admitting that this was uh, a most regrettable thing and a tragic thing. and extending an, an apology to the widow and child of the major, and yes, offering some compensation. Mr. President, it has been announced from Moscow that Mr. Gorbachev will come to uh, New York for the United Nations session in next September. Could you tell us today if you would meet him at that time? I'd be very, will very willing to. I've expressed uh, the, the belief that we should have a meeting and. Uh, his letter to me uh, acknowledged that and said that he felt the same way. Now, I don't know what his schedule, he will be coming here for the United Nations, whatever it is, if that should be the time, I certainly could arrange mine to, to accommodate and have that meeting. And uh, one of the reasons why I think such, such a meeting should take place is I've always believed that people get in trouble when they're talking about each other instead of when they're talking to each other. And what will you tell him to Gorbachev? What? What will you tell him when he comes? Well, I think, I think that there, when we meet there should be some open discussion about some of these differences, some of the things that cause us all to be suspicious of each other, and uh, see if we can't get some things out in the open on the table to, uh, so that we understand each other better. Thank you very much, Mr. President, granting us this interview. Please allow me this last question. <clears throat> we Germans hope 
your heart is not too heavy after all these misunderstandings regarding your visit. Forty years after the Second World War, what message would you have for the people of the Federal Republic? The message that I would have for them, and particularly in this anniversary situation that is coming up, is one of recognition that for 40 years uh, we have been friends. The, the summit meeting consists of the heads of state of countries that were 40 years ago bitter enemies. We're friends. We have been at peace. I would, I would extend my own admiration for the uh, democracy that the people of Germany have